Welcome to Why I'll Never Make It, a lighthearted podcast that takes a revealing look at a career in the entertainment industry, featuring stories and conversations with those on stage and backstage, on screen and behind the scenes. To keep up with all the guests and episodes, go to the website, winmepodcast.com. There you will find ways to follow and connect via Twitter and Instagram, as well as ways to support and donate to this podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Oliver Jones, and this is Why I'll Never Make It. Hi there, and welcome back to the podcast. Well, audition season is winding up here in New York City as we prepare for the summertime, and I hope you have some good plans for the summer. For for myself, I will be doing a couple of shows in St. Louis and another one in Raleigh, and so I'm looking forward to that. My special guest today is also keeping himself very busy. Ethan Paisley is a writer, producer, speaker, and he also has an upcoming project this summer for DVD Netflix, a TV series called The Set Life. His other projects have included Point Four Fifty Three, which is on Amazon. He's had two films that have screened at the Cannes Film Festival. And when it comes to awards, Ethan is certainly no stranger as well. He won Best Overall Film at the San Mauro Torinese Film Festival, Best Young Filmmaker at the Los Angeles Film Awards, and Best Young Director at the Young Entertainer Awards. So how young is he, you're probably asking? Well, he's accomplished all this at the ripe old age of 18. So when I ask myself why I'm not making it, well, it's guys like this that have the drive and ambition that keep them going. Thank you so much for joining me from the West Coast. Of course. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> yes. You, uh, you, you were telling me you just came from class. Is that correct? Yes, I did. Represent Chapman University. <laughs> so <laughs> what are you studying there at Chapman? I am studying creative producing. I'm part of the BFA program. So it's a producing-centric um, program within the film school at Chapman. Um, but I just came from a cultural anthropology class. Is that feeding into the, your your film studies as well, or is that just an, an extra interest of yours? It's an extra interest of mine that I want to pursue as a minor, but I think it's really important to take classes that lay outside of you know the the everyday because they're going to feed your imagination and expand you know your your grasp on humanity which is all we're trying to do as artists so yeah i mean because it really is all about storytelling whether you're you know on the producing directing side or on the actor side we're all trying to like tell a story and the more that we have life experience the more that we know about other peoples other cultures other countries whatever it may be then i think the more well-rounded our own storytelling will be absolutely yeah. absolutely you couldn't say it better <laughs> so you got your start uh as an actor Correct. Were you doing plays and musicals at the same time? Oh, yeah. Plays, musicals. By like 10 years old, I was like hungry to do on camera stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I'm still the same way. I still, I mean, I'm not doing it professionally as much, but I'm still creating up characters everywhere I go. And I have all this energy I need to get out there. So, nothing's really changed since I was a kid. Um, but yeah, no. So, I, I kind of did it all when I was a kid. I loved all of it. But eventually you transitioned and wanted to do more behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, I always say like I was about 12 or 13. And I mean, it's that age when you're going out on auditions and you're too young to be old. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> the olds are always taking your parts because it's cheaper to insure them and so it was just, I was just at that stage in the acting game. And um, around the time I was really into YouTube, I mean, I was like a preteen. So Smosh and Shane Dawson were like my life. Um, <laughs> so then I decided to like kind of recreate that on my own with my own YouTube channel where I did comedy sketch. And um, I didn't know it at the time, but I really was like teaching myself how to be a filmmaker. I mean, at least like the beginnings of it, because I learned how to create new stories every week, how to engage an audience, how to really like produce for a web series. Um, and that skill set, I think, slowly grew and translated over to short filmmaking and feature filmmaking and what I do now, um, which is producing. So it's, 
it's been an interesting ride for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it sounds like it. And I mean, I mean, it, it's so funny. I have to laugh because when you talk about, you know, 12 or 13 and all the 18 year olds are taking, <laughs> it's like a five, six year difference between the two. But whenever you're 12, that is a big difference between 18, especially yeah. when you're trying to be an actor or singer. Right. It's totally frustrating. So I, I, you know, feel like, or I felt like, you know, why not just create characters for myself? Why not create my own TV show? And I still feel that way now, like acting is still, you know, in my heart and one of my many passions. So I hope by producing, I can like eventually reinsert myself as a character in one of my own films, you know, Uh, not trying to say like an actor's job, you can just do it anytime. I mean, I've I want to get back into it. I'd have to like train again. So it's it's definitely still something I care about and, and want to pursue again at some point. So in your transition from going to more acting to then wanting to direct and create your own work, how did that, how did you kind of bridge that transition? Um, I think there's a lot more in common with like directing and acting than people think. I think to be a good director or a filmmaker or, you know, a storyteller from the other side of the camera, you really have to understand what an actor goes through because that's the tool you're using to tell your story. So for me, it was it was pretty natural. Um, I mean, I really do fall on the producing, writing, directing side of things. I'm not a cinematographer. I'm not a kid that grew up watching Steven Spielberg and was like, I want to shoot dinosaurs for the rest of my life. Like, that wasn't who I was at all. I wasn't into being a DP or doing sound. Like, I was really set on, on just being like a, a storyteller grounded in writing or directing or something around around that. Um, so that's how I think I was able to make the transition. And I was also, when I was acting, I was still writing my own stories, doing my own plays. So, like, I had already dipped my toes in, in the directing world. And it was, it was really just now about, like, adapting to the new media, which was YouTube and using a camera or whatever. So with that, I mean, obviously, you know, our phones are now cameras. And so right. the the technology is a lot more present. So I'm, I assume that that helped you in your transition of doing more film work and getting on camera, being on YouTube and uh, and having followers there. It's really interesting because I feel like it's kind of a blessing and a curse. Like it's a double-edged sword now that everyone has a phone and can make a movie because it's great. You know, it's like everyone has a voice, but then again, everyone has a voice. So um it's interesting to look at how distribution is going to change, but yeah, no, I think that's, it, it really is um, in, in thanks to the day and age I live in for how I was able to get into filmmaking. It wouldn't have been that easy. And I probably would still be an actor, which is really funny to think about just because I, I didn't have the resource. I wouldn't have had the resources like 10 years ago or very true. That's, that's the time we're living in. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. And so what is it that draws you to a particular project, whether you're writing it or whether you are looking to produce something? I think what draws me to a project first and foremost is passion from whoever, like if someone's writing it and I'm producing it, you know, energy around the subject. I think I'm also looking for, um, really lately it's, it's changed. I used to be really about bringing any any story with a social conscious to life and I kind of wasn't in, in high school I was still finding my voice I still am um still will be for the rest of my life but I was I was really focused on you know making a difference through film however way that was and now it's interesting because I still want to make a difference through you know filmmaking but it's it's funny because I'm really I've been playing around with genres the past year with with shorts I've made and and even feature films and I'm finding that comedy is something I'm really drawn towards. I like grew up, like YouTube was all about doing comedy for me and, and all the plays I was in, I was always like the comic non-straight man or whatever. So now I'm really interested in comedy stories that have like a social angle and can give back while also making people laugh, while also making people comfortable. So spe- to get specific, that's, that's really what I'm interested in now. And I'm actually producing and developing a couple projects around that theme so oh very cool yeah can you can you talk about those or um a little under wraps they're they're a little under wraps yeah (laughs) but um yeah i'm 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 developing um two pilots right now and and one's actually going somewhere which is exciting and the other one is um a feature film but they're all like comedy and um like dramedy right but that's definitely like where my voice is leading me which i'm really excited about 
And so how have you found working in the, the business side of, of this industry and finding distribution for films, finding those people who are writing, who want to be produced and so on? Wow, that's a big question. I think it really comes back to the question you asked about, or the point you made about us all having iPhones. Like knowing that we live in a generation where we're making movies and TV and media for the small screen and not the big screen is a really big first step to knowing the kind of stories, you know, um, that are going to get made and make back money. So I think knowing that has helped me a lot. Um, I think in terms of finding writers, finding distribution, um, you know, it really is all about who you know, not what you know. That's just, you know, a factor of what we do. Um, and having the knowledge about the technology and the distribution and, and, you know, the small screen versus big screen. And then also just being a person who is able to use social media also to access people and opportunities and and whatever, those two things I think have really like come together to help me create, um, you know, a business platform for myself in the industry. I'd say I'm a bit of a transmedia producer when it comes to um, what I do, meaning I'm seeking out stories and putting out stories onto different platforms um, with, you know, that are challenging normal ways of filmmaking. So that's what I do and that's what I love to do. So, yeah, it's interesting that you bring up social media because that is, it, it enables you to both, as you said, network and and uh, kind of reach out to other people, which is actually how you and I found each other right. through Instagram, exactly. as well as it's a platform to market and to promote your yourself, promote your projects. And so social media has really enabled, I think, us to capitalize on both of those aspects. Mm -hmm. And for filmmakers, I imagine that it's kind of a godsend to have that that type of uh, that type of gateway into such a large audience. Absolutely, yeah. It's funny. I mean, I even remember like a couple of weeks ago on a shoot, we were looking for a boom op, and we literally searched hashtag LA boom op, and we found our boom op on Instagram. So, <laughs> I also, you know, have yeah been able to grow like an audience for my films through social media, and of course do um, much broader things than just you know hiring someone on the crew last minute, but. Um, yeah, no, it really is um, an important tool. And I think people underestimate it. It's advantage my producing, yes. <laughs> Even though you've kind of been in this only a few years, what would you say is the, is the, the, the hardest struggle that you find in making films and kind of getting either yourself out there or the projects that you want produced out there? It's a really good question. And it's really important to talk about because I think we all really get caught up in um, measuring our, our self-worth with how much we have going on, how successful we are. So it's really important to just, you know, step back and reflect for a second. Um, I think the biggest challenge for anyone, actor, writer, director, producer, whatever you do in the business, I think it's really hard to find that compromise between making money and making art that um, is authentic to you. I think um, a lot of what people forget stepping into the entertainment business is that this is a business. It's not an artistic industry. There's no such thing as an artistic industry. This is a business where basically when you're going in for a pitch, you're not saying I have a great new artistic, awesome idea. You're going to get thrown out of the meeting because that doesn't make money and that's inconvenient. You go into the meeting and you say, well, it's King Kong meets Dracula or whatever it is. And that's how you get the deal. That's how you get the movie made. Um, so it's not a measure or reflection of your talent or your creativity. It's a business and it's how well you can, you know, fit the system. Um, and once you're in the box, becoming creative within the box, right? So hmm. once you have your script, um, and you have your production designer, you know, it's about creating, creating within the bounds that have been established by your financiers and the production company. So I think a lot of people forget that, but that's a really hard thing um, to accept coming from, say, training or, say, college or, you know, um, arenas where you've been allowed to create and, um, you know, tell the stories that, that you want to tell um, and exploring your voice as an authentic artist. I always say that. I'm like, everyone's trying try to tell me to find my voice. And then I'm in the room and it's hard for me to like articulate my voice because I've spent all this time trying to get in the room. So it's just 
I'd say that's the biggest challenge I faced. And it, it, it translates to so many other sub problems you experience as an artist. I, I find that to be so true. And New York is, is a really classic example of that because we have, we have Broadway, which as for all of its wonderful artistic endeavor and the wonderful artists that are on the stage, it really is a numbers game because if people, if butts aren't in the seat, then the show isn't going to last. And then and right. it doesn't matter how good the show is or how great right. the performances are. Then you have off Broadway, which is kind of that middle ground of you can make some money doing it and, and, and it's about numbers, but you can also have a bit more of, of, of a passion project that you can, that you can mm-hmm. do something that has a message like, like you were talking about earlier. Then there's the off, off Broadway, which is just, it's a free for all. I mean, it's people really making no money and you kind of just kind of scrounge together a few people who are volunteering their time or their work and you just kind of do something that you love. Sometimes it's absolute crap. Sometimes it's, <laughs> right. it's sometimes it's this masterpiece that is in the in the closet of some theater somewhere. So, New York, I think, really has uh, that runs the whole gamut when it comes to to that artistic versus business side. Mm, that's such a good example that I think so many people will help so many people better to understand Hollywood too because it's so so much the similar way where you have. I mean, studio films don't really exist anymore, but you know, like box office hits and then you have independent and then you have like short film independent. And it's funny because of course, like most of the joy I've gained in in making films has come from making like five minute proof of concept, short form content. Um, That's just a really great like punch of an idea and um, would otherwise never like get distribution or any money made off of it. So it's really true how how like there's there's such a large gap between doing exactly what you want and what you're passionate about and and making money. Um, but I think there's there are ways to make it work, and you do make it work. And I think some of the best advice I've heard is like once you're in the box, be creative in the box, which I think is a really good way of putting it because it means you've made it in right. But then once you're in, you can use that voice and use whatever's inside of you to um, make something that much more authentic or that much more, which, which I think is, is what successful films do is, um, you know, they meet all the criteria for a box office success and that's why they're box office successes. But then, you know, the nuances and the moments that you remember from those films are because of the creative people who've added a bit of their authenticity to that script or to that formula. And, um, and that's what you're left with. That's what you take away. And, um, and that's what, that's what inspires all of us to do what we, we love to do is, is those moments in movies and Broadway and whatever, you know, that motivate creativity, but it's funny how it trails back all back to that same place. Yeah. Because when, when it comes to films, there are those low budget films where it's like two actors and they're just kind of talking in their living room and we may find out a little bit more about them and their interaction, their relationship. And then you have a film and then you have, like you said, the big blockbusters, you know, I think Marvel is, is the classic example of that right now. They're, they're the, you know, the biggest thing when it comes to the Avengers and and the whole series and their whole world of super heroes that yeah it's not just a bunch of explosions and people fighting there's also they're also trying to incorporate those real stories and ways for an audience to connect individually with whether it's you know thor or whether it's iron man they still want them to be real believable and enjoyable characters yeah absolutely i think that's a really interesting example i'm not a big marvel fan myself but um i totally see what you're saying um, in terms of, yeah, that, that theory of once you're in the box, get creative in the box. So, I, so I'm curious, I would love to kind of get your, get a sense of your process. And so, for example, this, uh, this project that you have coming up in June, mm-hmm. uh, Set Life. Yeah. I was wondering if you could just kind of start with how it began go through the process of then getting, uh, pitching it, distributing it, and, and how it came to actually uh, coming to, uh, to fruition here in June. Sure. Um, really interesting. I was approached by a magazine owner 
who is also the director for DVD Netflix's social media and marketing. Um, and she basically has, she's done a, a, a bit of coverage on me over the years um, and um, has been a huge supporter of, of my projects and wanted just to do something beyond like, um, you know, a, a press spot on, on something I'm doing and, and really like was in, enthusiastic about possibly doing um, a series for the DVD Netflix platform that would promote DVD Netflix as a company, um, but also take people behind the scenes of filmmaking in, in the modern age. So what it's developed into is it's a six-part docu-series, a little bit about my life and a little bit about the life of other independent filmmakers um, in the six steps it takes to make a movie. So episode one's development, episodes two pre-production, we finish off at distribution and promotion. And in each episode, what people are gonna see is a little bit about my process and, and how I go through development, go through pre-production, but then how also other independent filmmakers are tackling, tackling it so that we can kind of unravel for everyone what it takes to you know, develop, finance, and distribute a movie in 2019. So it's really exciting. Um, and that's going to be released on the DVD Netflix YouTube platform and a couple other VOD channels. And we hope to actually get it onto Netflix or get a spinoff or a documentary made that gives that same exposure to, to filmmaking in the modern age to other people. I wanted to do it because there's so many young people that, that are interested in filmmaking now with, you know, having iPhones and having access to whatever. Um, so I want to just, you know, have some sort of model or educational foundation for those people to get some information from. And we interview and uh, we go behind the scenes of a lot of awesome filmmakers projects. And I think he, I, I'm like so excited for it. Like it's, if I had had this when I was 14 or 13 or whatever, I would have like been so much farther ahead. So I'm, I'm really excited. Yeah. It sounds like a step-by-step -step of, of how to go from idea to, okay, now you're premiering and yeah, everything, exactly. everything, everything that yeah, happens so in between. People don't know, you know, so it'll be cool. It'll be really, it's, and it's just fun. It's going to be really fun. I host it. Yeah. <laughs> I imagine, I imagine it must be a little, a little strange to kind of be filming about what you're filming about. If, if you don't, yeah, I mean, because, because you're talking about d distribution and production of a show that's talking about distribution and production. So you're almost like documenting the show that you're producing. Almost. Yeah, I know, totally. It's totally trippy. It's it's been kind of weird, but like it's fine. <laughs> it's going really well. And going through this process of of filming and producing set life, was there anything that came up? At, especially as you talk to other filmmakers, was there anything that came up for you where you were like, "Oh, I I I hadn't looked at it that way, or I hadn't thought about it that way." Oh, all the time. Which is what's so great is I'm kind of going through it with the audience. You know, I'm kind of like learning new things about this process along the way. It's interesting, it's interesting to see different backgrounds people come from and, and what they know about the process and don't know about the process. So for example, like on our post-production episode, like we visited, you know, a post-production facility for a feature film. It was interesting how, how specific everyone in each of those processes is to that specific process. And that's something I've kind of learned as well. Everybody in Hollywood kind of does one thing and they're really good at it but they kind of don't know anything about anything else. And it's funny as a producer, cause like your whole job is to know everyone's jobs, but everyone who's like an editor or even an actor or a DP, like that's what they know. <laughs> like that's what they do. And, and that's all they do. I guess that's what I've learned the most from, from doing the show is I'm like, oh, I thought everybody, you know, knew how it worked from once from rap to post-production. But no, they don't. Like they hand it off to the DIT, and then it's it's in post, and they don't know anything about that. Yeah, it, it was interesting. It, at the beginning of uh, of this season two of the podcast, I had a good friend of mine who is a sound editor, and just the differences between a sound editor to a sound mixer to a foley artist. I mean, I mean, they, they're all very related, but all very specific. In the, because there's one who gathers the sounds, there's one who edits the sounds, and then another person who mixes the sounds. It's and and that's just audio and that's just creating like sound effects or background noise or this or that. And I can only imagine the layers of people it takes for every step along the way. Yeah. And that's so important you know, as a producer because you're the one managing and hiring and and facilitating all those people. So it's really it's been really like great that I've I've got to go through the show and like learn with with the audience and 
and just identify each of those roles in the filmmaking process. So I'm a person, I love to do everything. I would like love one day to be like, you know, um, an Issa Rae and like act in my own show and show run it also and produce it. Like someone I look up to so much. Um, I'm definitely not <laughs> like the, the DP or the, the editor. Yeah, it's crazy. So when it comes to your own kind of projects or, I mean, you, you're in school now and so you're going to get that really formal training. But once, as you look forward and from the stuff that you've done to the stuff that you want to do, what is it that's really drawing your attention? What is it that's kind of, you're, as you go through this, you're finding out, you know what, in five years, this is what I want to be doing. This is where I want to be. It's really cool what school's done because it's definitely opened my eyes to like what, just kind of every aspect of the process and, and what I don't like about it, right? Because I've, I've been so focused on like loving it, loving it all these years. And um, now I'm doing it professionally um, and working full-time outside of school. So I'm really getting like a lot of perspective on it. Um, it's funny because I think I can see myself doing more PR work and possibly talent management. I feel like a lot of my skills lie in people. So it's interesting just to see how that's become um, one of my focuses, like just moving forward. You kind of still see yourself doing the producing and filmmaking, but maybe right. talent but maybe representation like, or something. A couple of clients. Yeah. It's funny. Like people are always asking me to be their manager. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I would never like that sounds so boring um which i would never want to be a manager it's it's not creative enough <laughs> i think i think i do i work best with people and i work best with um you know that aspect of the process hiring hiring the crew hiring the cast and managing them throughout the process and also um you know as a producer i'm involved in the development and also the exhibition and promotion of a film which is where my pr skills i think of have come to, to show. But I think as a producer, you have different, you know, strengths um, at different aspects of the process. So um, I might not be a producer producer, I might be a line producer, or I might be a unit publicist, like who knows, um, but something in, in the production world, yes, like that's what I'm dead set on. <laughs> right, because because just as I was talking about the, the sound and all the different levels and different intricacies of what goes into sound, producing is the same way, you know, line producer, executive producer, co-producer, and then producers do different things within the uh, within each project. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's so delineated in that, yep, in that way. Absolutely. And you had mentioned that you're finding out some things that you don't like about the process. <laughs> so I, I'm curious what those are. I guess it's funny, like, I, I love development, but I also kind of hate it. I don't think I could work in development long term. Um, I've literally been working on a feature script for like four years, like as a development producer, and it's still not there. So like, I, I just, I'm a person where I obviously like, I like to have multiple tasks, new tasks every day. Um, I don't like just to focus on one thing. Um, and that's, that's one aspect of producing where it's like, you really, as a feature film producer, you know, you might have a project for 10 years and that includes development that includes, uh, the, the post-production and delays and shooting for 10 months. Um, I also don't like being on set <laughs> unless I'm an actor. <laughs> I really don't. Um, I don't like long hours and, and waiting and, um, you know, really not having much of a role other than just taking care of my crew. I mean, I love to take care of my crew and socialize and, and see the movie get made, but not every day for 10 months out of the year. So I guess those two aspects, which, which is funny because that's what I love the most about being an actor or a director um, is, is the script and, you know, being on set. As, as you say that, it makes me think about one of the big differences between, uh, between the actor as well as the director-producer side is that for us actors, I mean, we can really only do one project at a time. We might be able to, to be able to, to do a musical and then have a cabaret that happens at the same time. Right. But it's not like we could do a, a musical, a film, and then we have another show in another city. You know, there's only so much that we right. can do at any one given time. But for a producer there's a show that may be four years in development and it's just kind of trickling along. And then, so you have these other three, four, five, six projects that are also in the pipeline. So you're constantly juggling what's going to come next and what needs your hand in it at any given time. Right. Right. Well, and that's, I mean, that's the part of, part of the process I do love is the multi the multitasking, but no, and it is, it is very daunting, you know, having multiple projects at once, like I do right now, and you're, you're kind of just showing your cards and, and seeing what gets 
picked up and you kind of, if you really don't have control, it's kind of like acting where you're going out on auditions and, you know, you really don't know when it's going to take off. So, um, but luckily things are moving really fast on, on some projects. So I'm excited. What is it that you miss most about acting since that's something you, you haven't done in a while? Wow. I think, well, there's a lot of things I don't miss about it. <laughs> 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 like I don't miss... I don't know. It, it really, I think people really forget with acting that, I mean, it is really a lot of work to first be able to master the craft, but then to also be able to be consistent with your marketing materials and getting updated headshots every six months. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's a really, it's a small business you're investing in for yourself. And that part is, is something I definitely don't miss. But what I do miss about it, I think is, um, as I said, at the beginning of our call, like I have a lot of energy and I always create characters just in my life like to cope with my problems and I I'm an emotional person I have a lot (laughs) going on so I mean I miss having an outlet really to like put that into I mean and luckily there's writing but writing is it's a very different process than acting and acting is is so personal and so um it's not like writing where you know you have an outline and you have you have time to, to create a script it's like it's at six o'clock you get a script and then at eight you audition and it's like you have two hours to like internalize and so it's definitely a different way of getting out your emotions and that's what I miss about it yeah because writing is one of those things that I have like had in the back of my mind like maybe at some point I want to do that you know rummaging around in my brain but it's something mm-hmm. I haven't really put pen to paper so I can imagine the because for us actors it's like you said, we may we may get a, a script aside uh, a day or two before work on that. Do the audition mm-hmm. done? On to the next thing, you know. And and it's the same thing with the project. It's like okay, we're doing the show for a month or two. All right, on to the next thing. But writing, it's as I'm sure you found out that it's okay. There's the first draft, then there's the tweaks, then there's the second draft, then there's tweet, and then the third. And you you're constantly okay. Well, now we got to get rid of that character because that's not working. And 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 then when it comes to actually casting it, okay. Well, now we need to rewrite that. So it's a constant flux of of constant changing that is years right, right. in the making. Which is sometimes. different than acting in the way that you know just the timelines um, differ so greatly. And no, writing is definitely, I mean, something I, I love just like acting and want to continue doing, but it's also not, you know, I mean, producing really is my strong suit. Writing is, it's, it's a different beast in a lot of ways. As you said, it could be 10 years before you get something to where it needs to be. Um, and I'm seeing that right now on, on a feature project that I wrote and, you know, oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> then there's money you have to raise and you do have to change things. And so there's a lot of compromise. and. Um, yeah, I think I think that's what also makes a successful writer from an unsuccessful writer is who's able to, you know, work the system in their writing, which is kind of crazy, <laughs> kind of crazy concept just to make a movie that's going to be profitable, but also creative. Again, that compromise you have to make um, is really significant as a writer, I think. As you say that, it really brings to mind how different this industry is from from the normal nine to fivers and in general we we have that concept of, of how different it's not it, and not just from an artistic and craft standpoint but also we not only have to like train be actors be able to embody a character keep our voices uh, up to par and and training but then we have to promote ourselves we have to market ourselves we have to then do the networking the business side of it and it's a constant flux of trying to balance both of those while enjoying both and and sometimes you do sometimes you don't right right absolutely it's just something you you have to do and it's about again like as a writer as an actor as a director it's funny just just how you know all of our um all of those things you just mentioned you know we all have to go through together um and that's what makes our industry different is that (laughs) that's a necessity so in the the actors that you bring on, I assume they're mostly friends, or do you audition people, or how, how does that process usually work for the project? You uh, have? It's changed over the years. Used to be friends turned into like people I auditioned. Um, now it's all about packaging a project and finding you know real actors, like you know big big time actors that'll raise up the budget and that'll um, you know bring in the audience. So um, it's definitely fluctuated. Um, but I love actors cause I understand what actors go through. And I think that's something that makes me different as a producer. Definitely. Um, just being, you know, again, like the facilitator and 
the friend to everyone and the mentor to everyone during the process, like it's, it's, I think something that talent like about working with me. And that's something I want to explore as, as another career avenue, whether that's like being a representative in some way, um, or, you know, casting or something like that, just because it's something I'm familiar with. What is it that you've seen as you've had to kind of go from just asking friends who want to volunteer their time and be, be in a, in a shoot you're doing to, to auditioning? What, what are you seeing, uh, in those that audition for you that you like? What is it that you're seeing that, oh, I wish actors just knew this or that? (laughs) Um, (laughs) Wow. Well, I think it's really important for actors to realize that the the script's already been written. So the role's already been decided for you. And all the information you need is on the page. Now it's your job to deliver that. And I think what actors I notice do is they get in their heads a lot about creating, just like say a writer going in for a big studio pitch, creating something outside of the format, outside of the formula. And that's when casting and and us filmmakers look at each other and we're like, "Mm, there was something off about that performance because it just wasn't telling the story that was on the page. And as a producer, um, when it comes to casting, it it comes to really deciding, you know, who's going to tell the story best. And if you're not telling the words that are on the paper, then you're not telling the story best and you're not going to get the part. And I think it's just as, as simple as that. So um, what I'm always looking for is somebody who can really deliver the material. And, you know, of course, that also comes to, you know, your look and your marketing or, or whatever. That's, that's a factor of casting um, a lot of the time. But um, it's really who's going to tell our story best, first and foremost. I think that's what makes, I think that's what makes the good actors from the bad actors. Is, is those who understand that. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, ultimately, that's that's what we as actors are. We're storytellers. And that's whether it's our own work or whether it's someone else's. We have to imbue that character with interest, with colors, with, you know, ups and downs, and so that an audience can relate. Yeah. And again, that brings us back to what we were talking about before, about being a well-rounded person. You know, you're studying anthropology, mm-hmm. for example. And what is it that you feel like you still have an experience that you still want to go? I mean, obviously you have years ahead of you to to keep growing and learning, but are there things that you're wanting to be like, you know, I really want to travel more or I really want to go, go do this or be this. Oh yeah. Oh my God. There's so much I still haven't done. Even in my industry, there's so much I still haven't seen. Like I'm like so hungry for, for just um, world experiences. So yeah, I know traveling more. I mean, we won't get into it, but like, I crashed my car last week. That's an experience. <laughs> um, I don't life. know. Oh my God. Uh, so much life. So many, you know, boy stories. And I mean, <laughs> I could, I could go on. Um, yeah. But I mean, definitely just, I crave more life all the time as an artist. And um, I'm really loving just seeing my voice, like come to me through, through those experiences and shape more of what I have to say. So yeah. Um, it's just all about taking risks and, putting yourself out there. And I think that's something I try to do every day, like just to keep myself happy is just put myself out there in a vulnerable position every day and just learn how to be more human. So that's, that's what I'm doing in college. That's what I'm doing in work and life. So. And what is it that you do outside of, you know, cause obviously film, the arts, it, it can, it can so consume our time. Oh, I mean, yeah. it certainly does for me. Like when, when I, when I look at my, my days or my weeks, it's like, okay, I did this audition. I had a podcast recording and then I went and saw a show and then repeat. <laughs> and, it, and it really is just like all insular when it comes to this business and trying to, you know, just try to keep, keep things uh, a, a lot of, a lot of things on the fire, so to speak. Um, What is it that you do outside of film to kind of keep your head elsewhere to kind of refresh yourself? Mm. Um, Well, I think if you love what you do, it's just what you do and it's your life. And I think through that, you're going to have life experiences. For me, um, completely outside of the industry, like I'm I'm a trail runner. So I, I like to long distance run. I find exercise to be really, really important. Um, I drink lots of coffee. Um, I spend time with my family. Uh, coffee can be its own habit, yeah, right? Like, its own it's hobby. like a, a box I have to check every day is coffee. Um, it, just adventures and, um, you know, like I'm young. I'm like in my 20s. Like I'm doing everything a 20-year-old would do. <laughs> 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 Going out. I don't know. Yeah, just a little bit of everything. Again, I really do think like if, if film is what you love, then it's what you love and you're going to be successful at doing it no matter what, if it's truly your passion. And 
um, it's going to bleed through every aspect of your life. So even while you're adventuring, you might make a movie while you're doing it, or it's going to, it's going to bring up some idea for a screenplay and that's going to like be your breakthrough moment or something. I mean, I just think there's opportunities to be successful in your industry everywhere while living your life. Um, and, and it's really important to, I think, put your life first. <laughs> like, don't let your career take control of your life. Like any other industry, you know, like we all hate the workaholic type and, you know, that's not the friend we want to be around. So, so be, be the person people want to be around and, and find a balance, which is easier said than done. <laughs> right. You have to be a full, full fleshed out human being, you know, right. first and yeah. foremost. Yeah. And so something that you had mentioned about having those experiences and then you're able to bring that into the craft itself. Uh, is there a project that you have worked on yourself that has been, that's been really personal and intimate to you? Well, everything I do comes from me somewhat. I mean, I'm not just like, you know, um, nose to the grind producing random scripts. Like everything I do comes from the heart. Um, I'd say my most personal film to date was Point Four Fifty Three, which is my second feature film I did, um, which is about basically a boy who is experiencing the uh, early symptoms of mental mental illness in a family that already has mental illness and um, eventually kind of becomes... Um, removed from his family just through personal um, hatred and then also conflict within the family. And, and when he's removed, he's brought back by by his father who um, really parallels him in a lot of ways. And their relationship kind of, as it fixes itself, fixes the rest of the family. Um, and it was a very personal film to me just because I went through a lot of that with with my own parents like when I was a kid and grew up around a lot of addiction and I think um the feelings that come out of that like isolation you know self-worth and any anything around that I think I like to look for in scripts to this day and 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 writing that script and producing that script for me was a cathartic release and also just an example of, of what I want to keep doing which is maybe not stories that so close to home but stories that still have those feelings and explore those themes of not feeling loved by your family and not feeling good enough and not feeling, you know, just feeling alone. So, I mean, I think that's, that's something I, I like to insert into everything I do a little bit. Which I think that that's one of the, one of the beauties of performing arts and theater has its own immediacy because it's live, it's person. You can see the, you, you, we can see the audience, the audience can see us and there's a connection there. And I think that film does it, although it's somewhat removed with the screen, but cameras can really get in close and find an intimacy that you can't have in the theater. So in mm -hmm. that way, the, you're kind of almost closer to the action or, yeah. or the int intimate moment. And so I think that that is a way to, to really not feel alone, to feel, oh, you know, this, as you said, this family is much like my family. And so I, I relate to that and understand that. And it's nice to know, oh my gosh, someone gets what I've been through. Right. And that's really interesting what you say about that film, because I think that's also why I love it so much is because it's it's just a space for me. I mean, I love theater, but I, I think it's just become a space for me to experiment with my emotions the, the best. So that's what's um, yeah, that's what keeps me coming back to it, I guess. And as you keep coming back to it, what is on the horizon for you? Obviously, you have the DVD Netflix series, which is coming in June. But what's what's kind of on the, the back burner that you're working on now? Um, wow, a lot of things and I'm really, really excited. I just actually, I wrapped two really great short films, both completely different from each other. One is about a girl who gets her period and has to like learn to love her struggling method actress mom. It's called Go With The Flow. It's a ridiculous <laughs> little comedy. Um, and then the other one's called Tell Me When To Forget. And it's about, uh, it's a psychological thriller about this woman who um, basically learns that she's her husband's been wiping her mind to forget the death of her son. So those are very <laughs> wow. different. Wow different stories we're telling here. Um, I also have a feature film um, that I can't say, I don't know how much I can say about it, but feature film that's going into production this year. Um, it's going to be my third feature script I've ever written, and I'm executive producing it. Um, and it's it's very, um, it's going to be very thought-provoking, I think, and people, I think, are really going to like it. Um, it's it's actually about the world of human trafficking and, and how a victim turns into a perpetrator. It's follows a very interesting kind of anti-hero arc. Um, so I have that coming up. And then I have, um, again, as I was saying, a lot of TV shows I'm developing. And one, actually, we just got news might be getting 
developed and produced by a production company in London to be distributed in Europe. So we'll see if that unfolds itself. Ethan but, is going um, international. Yes. London, USA distribution. I mean, we'll, we'll see. But anyways, yeah. I'm keeping myself busy. You know, I don't like to be bored. So I, I have all this going on and I'm loving it and just trying to make, make it all happen, <laughs> get it all done. Yeah, your uh, your drive and ambition is definitely uh, inspiring, and and it, it makes me realize that you know I still have a lot more to do, a lot more to say, a lot more to to, to get going on. Yeah. So I I thank you so much for being a part oh, of the yeah, podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This is awesome. I'm so glad we we got to talk about so many great things. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you. To learn more about Ethan Paisley, you can go to the website, winmepodcast.com. There in the show notes, you'll see all the details and links of stuff that we've talked about today, as well as a way to find him on social media, his website, and also on the Win Me Podcast website. You can find a link to help support my efforts in producing this weekly podcast. More importantly, if you enjoy listening to these stories and interviews as much as I love being a part of them, then please share this podcast with those who you think would enjoy and benefit from these conversations. As always, thank you for joining me and Ethan today. Don't miss a single episode by subscribing on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. I'm Patrick Oliver-Jones, and I'll see you next time on Why I'll Never Make It.